Oh, there we go. Yep. Okay, great. <clears throat> there we go. Well, thank you. I'm delighted and very honored uh, to, be, to be here to give the uh, 19th uh, Firth Lecture. Uh, I enjoyed meeting Mary Firth last night. I, I got my own tobacco stick, uh, so uh, that, uh, that's going to be a treasured uh, memento of, of this visit. I've changed the title slightly and made it carbohydrate uh, lipid interactions because I, rec I recognize that I'm going to talk about fructose as well as glucose just briefly. Uh, <clears throat> implications for weight control and niacin therapy. Uh, these, are, uh, these are my disclosures. Um, <clears throat> done a fair amount with, uh, with Merck and, and Abbott and, and so forth. You can see uh, uh, down through the down through the list. Well, let's start with a case. Here's a lady with a triglyceride level of 4,100. Three months later, still 4,300. Uh, so her blood is full of fat. If we had that tube of blood in the pocket, it would be creamy looking on the top. Uh, and she's got a mild gnawing abdominal pain. She has a papular skin eruption that we're going to look at. She's menopausal. She had recently increased her conjugated estrogens to 1.25 milligrams per day. And this is, the, uh, this is the skin eruption that she had. She actually had it mostly on her elbows, uh, a little bit on the trunk. And these are eruptive xanthomas. And when you see, if you see this, uh, your patient is at high risk for developing pancreatitis. Fortunately, her amylase and lipase were normal. Um, <clears throat> but the risk of pancreatitis greatly increases when the triglyceride levels are over 2,000 uh, milligrams per deciliter. And I want to use this case uh, to, uh, to, to illustrate something because here's the additional history. She's drinking 36 cans of Mountain Dew a day. She's not eating a lot of fat. She's taking in a tremendous amount of carbohydrate, and half of the calories that she's taking in are fructose. Fructose has no good uptake mechanism in muscle and fat. Fructose goes entirely into the liver. And when it comes out of the liver, it is triglyceride. Uh, so she, toler she had tolerated lipid medications poorly, and in fact, in fact, it's not, it's not medications that's going to that's going to help her anyway. Our medications for high triglyceride levels are just not very good. Uh, she's at 4,000. We might get the we might get the triglyceride down 30 or 40 percent, uh, but all of the lipid medications work pretty poorly uh, with triglycerides that high. Uh, she did not want to take uh, lipid medication. She did agree to reduce her soda intake, and it's crucial at this point that she actually avoid fat. I'll show you that in a moment. Advised to reduce estrogen. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted her to come off of the estrogens completely, uh, at least for a while. Uh, we settled on her reducing to 0.3 milligrams of, of conjugated estrogen, but she she uh, ended up not even doing that. Uh, so here's the course uh, that this lady followed. You can see that she's still on the conjugated estrogens about two months later, and yet by reducing the intake, the very high intake of, of uh, fructose, uh, her triglycerides have come down. The uh, cholesterol is extremely high, but this is a transitional state and not a steady state kind of cholesterol level. Uh, she later did reduce the estrogens. Her triglycerides are back up again. I think she had started, she had started drinking those sodas again. Uh, and finally later, she was taking phenofibrate and her triglyceride is down. She's got her intake down to about five sodas a day at this time uh, and subsequently has done fairly well uh, we still have difficulty uh, getting her to take medications that, that we would like for her to take. And I'm still seeing her. Um, <clears throat> she's dealing with, a, dealing with a number of other issues at, at the present time. So 
So is this an isolated uh, phenomenon? Is this just one patient? No, they, you can see this in other patients. And here's a man of Asian Indian background. He runs about 50 miles a week. His father had an MI at age 56. He doesn't want to get one. He has high lipoprotein little a, 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 actually a major inherited risk factor for heart disease. Um, his diet is almost entirely vegetarian. We think of that as a good diet for lipids, and yet uh, over a period of five months, <clears throat> he's got a, a over a, um, yeah, over a period of eight months, uh, he's got triglyceride levels of 478 and 630. It turned out that when he was coming in from his long runs about five times a week, he's drinking a liter of Gatorade. All right? And the Gatorade is driving the production of, whoop, driving the production of triglyceride by the liver, giving him that high triglyceride level without any medications at all, but with uh, weight loss, he's gone from 166 to 153 pounds, later came back up with, a, with weight loss it, and reduction of the high glycemic carbohydrates. It turns out in this case, not just the liquid carbohydrate in the Gatorade, but also reducing bread and potatoes, and in particular in the Asian diet, reducing rice in the diet, now he has a triglyceride level of 48, I'm sorry, uh, 48, which is more befitting someone who's running 50 miles a week. Uh, <clears throat> later on, not quite so good, uh, and eventually, I, I will tell you, he did go on a statin, uh, ultimately, to reduce his, his risk for heart disease. Uh, but never took a triglyceride-lowering medication has controlled that aspect of his of his story with with diet and diet is really the diet is really the driving force in in our patients with high triglycerides and we can do a lot if we get the diet right. Um, so high carbohydrate diet diets raise blood triglyceride levels. Now let's look in detail at some of the physiology uh, behind that. And what I've got here are the players in the game. We've got the fat cells that are the main store of energy in the body. You can store about one to two days worth of, en of, of energy in the form of glycogen in the liver and in the muscle cells. You can store two months, four months, eight months, 12 months of energy uh, in, the, in the fat cells. <clears throat> and so the body, the body actually knows that, and if the body has extra energy around being taken up in the diet and the intestines don't reject any of it unless you've had one of these famous gastric bypass surgeries from ECU, <laughs> uh, the, if the intestines generally take up all the calories that are, that are eaten, eaten, if it's less than 93%, you've got malabsorption. Uh, so the body is going to store that extra energy away as fat. And these are the pathways. Here are the fat calories coming in in the diet in the form of columicrons that uh, go through the intestinal lymphatics and get, eventually get into the bloodstream, bypassing the liver. Uh, here's the triglyceride coming from the liver. Here are carbohydrates that actually go everywhere in the body. The fructose targets the liver specifically. And very likely, high glycemic carbohydrates that give you a big boost of glucose also tend to target the liver more than the muscle and the fat cells. And importantly, the fat cells themselves are constantly releasing fatty acids. Uh, it turns out that no more than about 12, 10 to 15 pounds of fat in, in our bodies is, is very active, and that the, the fat deposits are not homogeneous, they're very heterogeneous, and some of those fat deposits are very insulin resistant. This is why when people lose just a little bit of weight, Sometimes their metabolism changes greatly because you reduce the active fat deposits, the very insulin-resistant fat deposits, and later on, about three to six months later on, 
even if they keep the weight down, the fat is redistributed and now the metabolism looks a little worse. But it gets better in a hurry because the most active fat deposits are releasing the fatty acids and so they shrink down first. Um, all right, well high triglycerides. High triglycerides come mostly from the liver in most people. And the reason is that the clearance of those collomicrons is very rapid. So we never have uh, collomicrons hanging around in the bloodstream very long. In the fasting state and through most of the day, the triglyceride level is governed by what's coming in, what's coming out of the liver uh, as a very constant stream. We have this particular enzyme lipoprotein lipase, which clears the fat out of the, out of the circulation, hydrolyzes the triglycerides, so the fatty acids at this point simply move into the fat cells and the muscle cells. Now, fatty acids are one of the major inputs into the liver of calories that are going to be represented as triglyceride in the bloodstream, and we, uh, that's about 70% of it and about 30% are the carbohydrates coming from the intestine. And uh, to, to treat high triglycerides, we have to work on both, but weight loss is the main thing that we're working on. Well, this situation changes when the triglyceride is above, uh, is above 1,000. When the triglyceride is above 1,000, uh, what happens? First of all, lipoprotein lipase has diminished activity. You know that because it's not doing its job of clearing the triglycerides. Secondly, you have a lipase that is uh, being inhibited by the triglyceride coming from the liver. It's all stuffed up. And so then instead of this being 15 minutes now, that rapid uh, that rapid clearance of columicrons becomes extremely slow. When the triglyceride is above 1,000, what you've got to do is go to a zero-fat diet. Below 1,000, it's lowering the carbohydrates that lowers the triglyceride in the bloodstream. Above 1,000, you've got to go to a zero-fat diet because this uh, triglyceride intake in this case can greatly increase the amount of triglyceride in the circulation, giving pancreatitis. So those are some of the principles that outlined how we dealt with, uh, how we dealt with, those, uh, with these patients. Now let me go to another topic, <clears throat> somewhat related. Uh, oh, this is just a summary, triglyceride over 1,000, zero fat diet. And you, what, what you need to know about this is even the good fats can cause pancreatitis. The good fats relate to cholesterol and what they do to LDL cholesterol, but the good fats as well as the bad fats can all cause pancreatitis in this situation. Uh, <clears throat> while I was seeing these patients, uh, Eric Westman at Duke was, uh, was uh, in contact with Robert Atkins of the Atkins Diet and uh, Eric was uh, initiating studies along with Will Yancey at Duke. Under this rationale, fatty acids are the major fuel for muscles and, tish and most tissues of the body, but the brain can't use fatty acids for fuel. In star the brain uses glucose, but in starvation, glucose production cannot be sustained at high levels. And I've already said the body stores only one to two days supply of energy in the form of glucose or glycogen. To replace the glucose, beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate, the keto acids are generated from fatty acids. And it just turns out that when you have keto acids circulating in the body, you become a little bit anorectic. And that uh, decrease in appetite is the basis uh, for uh, the success, or at least the temporary success, of the Atkins diet. Uh, <clears throat> Eric asked me to join uh, in that study, and uh, we had 60 patients on the Atkins diet, 60 patients on a low-fat diet, and those on the Atkins diet over a six-month period lost more weight than those on the, on the low-fat 
calorie restricted diet and this is due to the anorectic effect of, uh, of keto acids. In the lipid clinic I really didn't want to go to an Atkins diet uh, to treat my patients so I took a sort of a halfway approach and I just noticed uh, that, if we, that if we adopted the idea of no bread, no potatoes, we were going to be taking about 30 or 40 percent of the calories out of the diet of most of our patients. And so we decided to go with what, we call, uh, what, was, what was becoming known at that time as a low glycemic diet. And we simply, uh, this, is, this is our handout that has, that has worked the best. I've got about 70 foods listed, 70 food types listed here. And on the left-hand column are the very low glycemic foods, uh, beans, uh, uh, some, of the, some of the fruits, although you have to be careful about fruit because it's 50% of the calories in all fruit are composed of fructose, which becomes triglyceride in the body. Uh, <clears throat> and so we limited fruit to two servings a day. Uh, meat, is, meat is down here uh, and nuts and so forth. And here, all the bread, both white bread and whole grain bread, have almost all the same glycemic index. Whole grain bread doesn't gain you anything. Sweet potatoes, however, are better than, uh, than the white potatoes. Uh, as we began to, we implemented this diet in 2001. And we looked at patients with high triglyceride and simply looked at how much weight these patients uh, were, were losing. We were trying to get them all to lose weight for the reasons that I've already given. Prior to the implementation of this diet, uh, we had no weight loss at all beyond the first year. I'll show you within the first year, we had a little bit of weight loss, uh, but they regained. And beyond the first year, no weight loss. And since 2001, we've had a very consistent picture where the average patient who is still coming, the average patient is still coming to the clinic. We didn't, this is not intention to treat, but the average patient is still coming to the clinic, 3% weight loss uh, beyond the first year. Here's group one uh, before 2001, then after 2001, group two, and this is simply the time course of weight, and you can see in the first group, the earlier patients were losing a little bit of weight by six months, but by one year they were back, uh, they were back where they were. Now that's actually a little better than the average in America, which is a three to four pound weight gain every year. Uh, <clears throat> but they're back on track and, and uh, it looks like they're gonna be gaining that, gaining that weight uh, on track with everybody else. And these patients seem to stay down and seem to do well. We've had uh, patients on this diet over eight years, ten years now, <clears throat> and uh, many of them are continuing to do well. It's just, a, it's just a change in the way you eat rather than being any kind of a time-limited diet to lose the weight and then go back to eating the way you, the way you once did. You can't do that. <clears throat> now the most recent large national trial on weight loss is called the Pounds Lost Study. I've forgotten what the acronym stands for. But what Frank Sachs and George Bray and their colleagues did was look at the macronutrient effect on weight loss. That is, if you vary the amount of protein in the diet, if you vary the amount of carbohydrate, none of the groups went as, as low in carbohydrate as to become ketotic. So this is not the Atkins diet that we had studied, that we had studied at Duke earlier. It's, to, it's a two-year weight loss trial, which is, which is what you have to do these days uh, with weight loss. You have to get beyond that first year. And basically, there was no significant difference for higher protein, for higher or lower carbohydrate, or higher or lower fat. All of the four groups in the study it looks like there are three groups, but there are actually four groups, and they're comparing certain diets with high protein uh, or high fat or low fat, high or low carbohydrate. The patients who are getting higher protein are doing just a little better, but it's not statistically significant. Since the patients, uh, fat didn't make any difference at all in the diet. The patients who are getting more carbohydrate 
are doing not quite as well, not losing quite as much weight, but again, not statistically significant. So the <clears throat> conclusions of the Pounds loss study, among all the groups, there was 7% weight loss at one year, and we were, look, we were actually looking at the two-year results on that previous slide, about a 4% weight loss. Um, <clears throat> so that's actually pretty good. That's, that's, that's good weight loss. Uh, we, we think we would like, sure, we'd like to get down 30 or 40 or 50 pounds for some of our patients, but 3% uh, or 4% weight loss is really pretty good. The conclusion is any type of diet, Dr. Sachs wrote, when taught for the purpose of weight loss with enthusiasm and persistence can be effective. Well, what did it take? Weight loss in the Patton's Loss Study correlated with the number of counseling sessions attended. And you actually got 10% weight loss at two years if you attended at least two-thirds of the sessions, and the sessions were every two weeks throughout the two-year period. So there were almost 60 sessions over a two-year period. Uh, that's about... Uh, 60 times 60 minutes, 3,600 minutes of counseling that each, patient, that each patient would get. In contrast, patients coming into our clinic will get probably less than 30 minutes of total counseling of, of weight loss, and they're still getting 3% uh, weight loss. So what we have to do is figure out how to make a, a program that works into one that's, that, that can actually be practically done. Uh, you just can't uh, bring people in every two weeks to, to counsel them. So we send them over here to get their bypass or uh, we adopt that technique uh, uh, or we do perhaps a low glycemic diet. Now this is one of the interesting things. Whoop. Every group in the Pounds Law study had been advised to follow a low glycemic diet which is what, it's just buried it down in the methods somewhere. Every single group in that study was, was advised to follow a low glycemic diet. They knew what they were doing. Um, let me tell you about a, a book. My wife gave me this book for Christmas, uh, and it's a, it's a popular book. Uh, it's a sort of a popular science book. Uh, and I think, it's, I think it's one of the most uh, interesting and profound um, new directions in, in psychology uh, that we've seen recently. Willpower, that's an ancient word. The psychologists have avoided it like, the, like crazy for 90 years. Uh, ever since it was last used about 1910, 1905. <laughs> Why talk about willpower at medical grand rounds? And one of the key reasons is it has a very strong, complex, and poorly understood relationship with blood glucose, all right? And this is important. All right, a quick introduction. Uh, even Baumeister, who is the scientist, Tierney is a science reporter, even Baumeister uh, was reluctant to use the word willpower until just the last few years. In the 1990s, he was studying the same thing. He simply called it ego. Uh, and the idea was that if you had to do a lot, if, you were, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if you're making a lot of decisions of any kind, you might be picking out uh, patterns uh, for your wedding, okay? Uh, or of, of wedding gifts, you're making a lot of decisions, you're exhausted at the end of the day. If you're dealing with chronic pain, that depletes the power you have to, to actually make good decisions. Uh, if, you're, uh, if you're having to stick to a difficult task, which is what we all think about uh, with willpower, or if you're dealing with emotions of any kind, uh, it's depleting, and it's depleting the same stock of self-regulatory control that we use for all of these activities, and that's what he's shown over the years. Uh, you, you get into one kind of activity, or you deal with emotions, you show a film that shows hunters clubbing little baby seals or something like that, and everybody, everybody has to deal with that emotionally, then they can't do geometry problems. Uh, when they come out of that film, 
And that's common sense, but now they're studying it and they have good ways to study it. And we're not talking about free will here, which is a philosophical concept, uh, but for some of my patients sometimes I'm starting to talk about this, I say, well, free will has to work through this mechanism uh, if, if, that's, if that's your philosophy. You have a finite amount of willpower. It's restored by sleep. Sleep has to be good to have that willpower. Uh, and it becomes depleted through the day, and most bad decisions are made late in the evening. <laughs> you use the same stock of willpower for all manner of tasks. Um, how long, and this is how they measure it, persistent at geometry problems. They actually give them problems that have no answer. <laughs> <laughs> How well do the subjects uh, resist dietary temptation? They just have a plate of food in the room, and they tell them not to eat it, and they, they look and see how often they look over at it, okay? <laughs> how well are subjects able to think through a series of decisions? Do they make difficult but correct decisions, or do they just make the easy, safe decisions, which is what you do when, you're, when your mental energy is all down? And often that's no decision at all. So eating behavior. When you say the word willpower, most people think of eating. It's actually the most difficult area in which to apply willpower. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that comes out pretty strongly in the book is the idea that if you have a habit that you have established and you're simply following a habit, this is what I do, or, or I used to do that, but I don't do that anymore. If you're just following a habit, it doesn't it doesn't notch your willpower down for the rest of the day. Just following a habit. So use part of your willpower every day is what I tell my patients to establish habits and then just stubbornly follow them. Uh, willpower, uh, low or maybe descending glucose is associated with less control of decisions and emotions. Willpower is fueled by glucose. It can be bolstered simply by replenishing the brain store of fuel. If you get a, if you get a Coke, if you get a regular soda right after watching that horrible movie, you can do the geometry problems better. It's actually true. But two hours later, you're crashing, all right, because your glucose is going up and now it's coming down. And uh, I'll tell you, if, if you read the book as an endocrinologist uh, or as a, as a medical doctor, you'll be, you'll be uh, surprised at how rudimentary and poor their understanding of metabolism really is. And this is a great area for research, actually, that, that we are hoping to, to look into. So, high carbohydrate diets raise blood triglyceride levels. When the triglycerides over a thousand, dietary fat becomes critical. Low glycemic diets appear to work well for, uh, for weight loss, and one of the mechanisms might be that you smooth out the glucose level through the day and people actually are able to make better decisions on into the evening when, when a lot of overeating occurs. So uh, it's just it's getting the bread and potatoes out of the diet and uh, not having starch with the evening meal. Things like that uh, are helping our patients. Now I want to talk about niacin. Uh, what is it? It is vitamin B3, but for lipid treatment, we don't use it as a vitamin. It's a medication, 25 to 50 times the vitamin dose. It's the best clinically available HDL raising drug, about 25% at a dose of, of 2,000 milligrams a day. Favorable effects on all the lipoprotein classes, and it's the only drug we have that really lowers lipoprotein little a. Niacin also raises fasting glucose levels just a little bit, about 5%, uh, but that's, that's an interesting phenomenon. It's been associated with insulin resistance uh, in the past. Now, <clears throat> I was interested in this uh, mostly, mostly because of patients like this. Here's a, a, a man who's 55 years old, uh, presently, um, no, I'm sorry, he was 55 when he had his, um, when he first presented to me at, in about 1999, and he just had a myocardial infarction. He happened to have a high lipoprotein little a level. But what I want to show you uh, is uh, from his baseline lipids, given a statin, a good diet, 
uh, a, a, just a little bit of weight loss and, and uh, adding niacin, we brought his LDL down uh, to below 70 most of the time, close to 70 at this time, and we brought, also brought his HDL up about, uh, about 30%. Uh, from the 33 range or so up into the up into the range of the low 40s uh, and even up to 45. The most important thing about this slide, however, is the span of time. He's gone 12 years without any kind of recurrent cardiovascular event. And it's this patient and 50 others who have gone for long periods of time with very good lipids that make me think that the statin niacin combination is just about the best thing that we can that we can put our patients on and I'm always trying to get my car my coronary patients on niacin as well as a statin if we can well all right niacin has a lot of effects in the body turns out <coughs> that um, We've, it turns out that it has effects on fat cells. It l reduces the release of fatty acids from fat cells. It has effects in the skin, and we, uh, we all know about the flushing effects. Interestingly, this is perhaps one of the most interesting effects, it raises two cell surface proteins that have to do with reverse cholesterol transport. So it may be helping to push cholesterol into the reverse cholesterol transport pathway, some beneficial effects on, on endothelial cells, and then effects on the liver that are really poorly understood at this point in time. What is this GPR109A? It's called the niacin receptor. It's not present in the liver, and it has nothing to do with the, uh, with the lipoprotein effects of, of niacin, actually. It's separate. It does cause the flushing, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, it's been suspected since 1968, uh, and inhibitor experience, experiments really implicated a G-protein receptor uh, over the years. In 2003, three groups cloned the receptor uh, and, and really identified it. It's here on the surface of, of a fat cell. Um, uh, niacin is a very simple molecule, just uh, pyridine carboxylic acid, uh, and that totally describes it. Uh, and it inhibits cyclic AMP, in, in, inhibits cyclic AMP in adipocytes, and inhibits lipolysis, inhibits the breakdown of triglycerides and that release of fatty acids. In the skin, it operates on a dendritic cell. The dendritic cell then makes prostaglandins, especially this one, prostaglandin D2, which has effects on the microvasculature causing the flushing. Probably effects on mast cells as well, perhaps to release histamine and cause some pruritus, uh, which is a part of the flushing reaction. Now, the, uh, uh, thinking especially about the receptor on the fat cells, it's very clear that the natural ligand for this receptor, the, the ligand that's uh, that been directed by evolution, is in fact beta-hydroxybutyrate. It's that same, it's that keto acid we were talking about earlier. Because the half maximal effect for beta-hydroxybutyrate on the receptor at, uh, at, 0 .8, uh, at 0 0.8 micromolar is in the range that beta-hydroxybutyrate levels can actually reach during starvation. And why would it be useful for beta-hydroxybutyrate to have a feedback on the fat cells to reduce lipolysis? Well, when you make those fatty acids and send them to the liver, that's actually the first step in generating the keto acids. So this is a receptor that will limit the ketoacidosis that we get into with starvation. It's part of the feedback control system in the body. It just happens that niacin binds that receptor very effectively. And interestingly, physiologic levels of niacin are way below the level 
to, to cause binding to the receptor. We don't eat, uh, we don't eat uh, rutabagas and flush uh, with the, with, from the niacin in the rutabagas uh, and, and our other vegetables uh, because, uh, because this is, it's not, it's, niacin is not the natural ligand for this recept receptor. The levels are physiologically too low. Only pharmacologically do we get them. So beta-hydroxybutyrate down-regulates lipolysis and limits ketoacidosis in starvation. We'll get to that, but this, this understanding, this physiology helped me in a couple of experiments that we were, that we were doing uh, and a couple of studies that we were doing. One was a large study with Merck. It was a secondary analysis of a, of a study in which we were looking at the effect of ezetimibe simvastatin or Vitorin plus niacin and simply asking what would that do to the lipoproteins? Would it have good lipoprotein effects? Well, I already knew that. We already knew that because we'd had a few patients in, uh, on Vitorin and niacin and the lipid effects are outstanding. Uh, nevertheless, uh, as a drug company, you have to do trials with a lot of people, 942, almost 600 taking, taking niacin. And this is what we saw with glucose uh, during the study. I'll just focus on the top two panels here. And the blue line uh, is with niacin, the yellow line is with niacin, the red line is without niacin, and you can see that there's a gap between the two groups that appears between 8 and 24 months, and then the gap closes down later on. So niacin is raising the glucose just a little bit, but it peaks and then it goes away. And we thought about that, and that's very similar to what happens with flushing. The same, time that, the same time that the glucose is separating from the not, patients not taking niacin, the, that's when the patients are flushing. And both of those, we think, might be effects on a G-protein coupled receptor because those receptors adapt. You have something called beta arrestin, which binds the receptor in the cytoplasm and it down-regulates that receptor. It inhibits that receptor as a uh, G-protein coupled receptors give you a sudden signal and then it down-regulates the pathway. And we think that's what might be happening. Now, interestingly, we also ask the question, what about, what about diabetes? And it turned out that um, a certain number of patients in the study had glucose levels just to below 125 and niacin raised their glucose a little bit, enough to call them diabetic. And that was all happening in the same period of time, 12 to 24 weeks. So this was 25 cases of new onset diabetes out of the 600 patients taking niacin. <clears throat> and a, a much lesser number, much lesser percent of patients uh, on ezetimibe simvastatin. Of course, you're always going to have new cases of diabetes at a slow rate. But the interesting thing was that after the first 24 weeks, here are 40 weeks and only three more cases in the niacin, in the niacin treated group. So both the elevation in glucose and the apparent increase in new cases of diabetes is occurring early uh, at the same time when we think that a G-protein coupled receptor might be having effects and we know that that G-protein coupled receptor interferes with fuel metabolism, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's going to be our, our hypothesis uh, going forward. So this just shows that. I won't belabor that. Let's go on to the next slide. We know that niacin binding to GPR109A strongly inhibits adipocyte triglyceride lipolysis and fatty acid release. The resulting perturbation in fuel supply might be linked to increased uh, fasting glucose and insulin levels. We speculate that the waning of the hyperglycemic effect analogous to flushing might be related to potential desensitization of GPR109A on the adipocytes. And it's, it is a very spec speculative statement. Um, but it, it's reasonable considering the physiology. Now there's another aspect of niacin treatment that we had noticed, and that is that fasting glucose levels sometimes were in a, a fairly high range, not quite diabetic, but then we'd get a hemoglobin A1C and it was surprisingly low. 
So we decided to look at all the patients in our database uh, that, that we've kept at Duke over the years. And uh, we actually uh, verified by going back to the chart or the electronic, even the paper chart or the electronic record and making sure it was a morning fasting glucose that we were dealing with. Most of these patients actually had diabetes, uh, but we had a number of non-diabetic patients, and this is what we saw. We had a cloud of points, and we simply plotted fasting glucose versus hemoglobin A1C. But that cloud of points had a general shape of rising as you get to higher hemoglobin A1Cs. Naturally, your fasting glucose is going to be higher. And you can do a linear regression on that. And the regression line, if the patient was taking niacin, was this solid line. And the, uh, the thick dashed line is the regression line if the patients were not taking uh, niacin. So our impression that patients who had good glucose metabolism and had low hemoglobin A1C, niacin would specifically raise the fasting glucose as opposed to the glucose through the rest of the day, which is what determines hemoglobin A1C. We had controls, and that is the patients who were taking statins or taking fibrates. It turns out, surprising to us, that statins exhibited the same phenomenon the fasting glucose is relatively elevated, just a little bit, just five, five milligrams per deciliter or so, compared to glucose levels through the rest of the day. With fibrates, we don't see the phenomenon at all. And in fact, if uh, the patient's diabetic, those lines are right on top of each other, and we don't see that, we don't see it there either. This, we just published this. Now, what if they're taking both niacin and statin? The effect is actually stronger. It's additive. This, these are the patients taking both drugs, no drug at all, one or the other uh, drug. These are the regression lines. And again, we're going to speculate, and I'll just read the bottom line here. Increased morning fasting glucose levels might represent an unrestrained response to nocturnal counter-regulatory hormone secretion involved in fuel metabolism because glucose, uh, 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 because you, you, your body uh, early in the morning begins raising the glucose level or causing a little bit of insulin resistance to support, uh, to support the idea of waking up. Well, let's go to the AIM HIGH study. And the AIM HIGH study had the objective of looking at the HDL raising effect of niacin and asking, does that reduce cardiovascular events? The answer is no. The, uh, <clears throat> the event curves are right on top of each other. The p-value is 0.79. And uh, the overall conclusion from the AIM High study is that niacin did not mitigate risk now, the risk is appreciable in these patients. These patients had bad cardiovascular disease, and by the, uh, I guess about three and a half years was the average duration in the trial, and you have a, a good 18% of patients by three and a half years have had a recurrent cardiovascular risk. That's pretty high risk, 6% per year. So there's plenty of residual risk, despite the fact that the LDL cholesterol is around 70 but niacin didn't help it. Can we explain that? It was surprising to me because of my experience with those 50, with those 50 patients, uh, plus about 1,200 more patients that I put on niacin over the years. Those, are, those were the 50 were the most uh, spectacular ones. And previous studies with niacin, MI went down by 26%, cerebrovascular events by 26%. Here's another study with total mortality decreasing. Now, this is niacin clofibrate versus no treatment at all. It's a smaller number of patients. But actually, statistically significant reduction of events in the Stockholm ischemic heart disease study. Here are three angiographic trials with niacin used with cholestopol, niacin used with simvastatin, niacin used mostly with gemfibrozil. So niacin being used with other drugs, 
But what, what's the event reduction? 73% reduction of events, 70% reduction of events, 50% reduction of events, and the criteria for adjudicating events in these studies is the same as what it was in the AIM High study. Same criteria. Niacin had looked very, very good on the basis of these small studies and combination treatment studies <laughs> coronary drug project. So what's going on? All five of those trials that I just showed you used niacin given at meal times. Now we're going to get back to this idea of fuel metabolism. All right? And meal time's a good time for fuel because your fuel's coming in through the intestines. Each of the positive trials used the mealtime niacin. Aim high used bedtime niacin, maybe with a light snack, but not a meal. Not enough to really replace Replace what? Well, we'll, we'll see that. Um, now, we know that all kinds of niacin actually make the, the artery wall better. There have actually been four studies of the bedtime niacin where the carotid lesions were shrinking. Statins actually don't shrink lesions. Statins will stabilize lesions, but it's very rare in a study to, to see lesions getting actually better with just statin therapy. You add niacin and the lesions now are shrinking, or you give niacin even with other drugs and the lesions are shrinking. So both immediate release niacin at mealtimes and ER niacin at bedtime improve the morphology of the arterial wall, make the plaques better, but only the niacin given at mealtimes is associated with reduced cardiovascular events, ER niacin at bedtime. Could the bedtime ER niacin be inducing some adverse pathophysiology that might even cause events and, and give, uh, uh, counteract the uh, beneficial effect on the arterial wall? Well, we've already said that the fatty acid levels go down. It turns out they go down a lot. This is three patients studied back in the, back, actually studied in the 1960s. 200 milligrams of niacin given orally and the fatty acid levels uh, in the fasting state go down by 60% in each of these patients. And this has been a very consistent finding over the years. It's that effect on the adipocytes, which is not the way that niacin makes the lipoproteins better, okay? So our hypothesis is that this 60% or greater drop in, in fatty acids is sensed by either the CNS or peripheral tissues as a threat to the body's fuel supply because fatty acids are the main supply of fuel to the muscles and other tissues of the body. A strong counter-regulatory hormone response is hypothesized, replacing fatty acids as fuels by greatly augmenting glucose production because glucose is the alternative fuel for the body. Catecholamines are released as part of the counter-regulatory hormones, and catecholamines are just exactly what you don't want if you have bad coronary disease. And this just shows uh, some, some early data suggesting uh, you can see this, this, this group had actually not received the stressful impact and 40% increase in the uh, epinephrine levels, not statistically significant. Uh, I look at that and I say, great, that means I can still do a study, <laughs> all right, and look at this. Um, and interestingly, I found this just earlier this week. Uh, this was a study in which Merck was looking at a flushing inhibitor and whether without the flushing, they, they actually wanted to look to see if the flushing inhibitor changed platelet reactivity. Platelet reactivity is greatly influenced by epinephrine. Epinephrine is one of the reagents we used in platelet aggregometry tests. Uh, it was not the flushing inhibitor, but it was niacin itself that caused a two and a half fold increase in platelet reactivity with the first dose. So we think that the HDL raising and possibly the increased reverse cholesterol transport by niacin is anti-atherogenic, but favorable effects are counterbalanced in AIM high by additional cardiovascular events due to catecholamine release following bedtime administration of extended release niacin. If you give the niacin at mealtimes, you're going to potentially avoid this response. We've got a lot of work to do. This is a, this is a work in progress. 
that's our uh, that's our our experimental plan. Uh, just so you won't do it ahead of me, I'll I'll flash it off. <laughs> <laughs> High carbohydrate diets raise plasma triglyceride, but triglyceride over a thousand. Uh, if the tr then dietary fat can dangerously raise tri plasma triglyceride. Low glycemic diet is gaining currency for weight loss and may operate partly through psychological mechanisms. The interaction between niacin and fatty acid and glucose metabolism might help to explain the AIM high results, um, <clears throat> whereas the previous results of niacin uh, given at mealtimes were actually very good. And I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>